remember while I was sitting this week, a song came to my mind. A song came to my mind that was released in the year 2004 uh, by John Legend. And many of us know it because it's a song, of course, called Ordinary People. Ordinary People. Ordinary People. We're just ordinary people. And as I began to reflect on that, and, and, and of course we know that it dealt with him in context of him between a man and a woman. But I want to really key in and understand that this also can apply to Christ and his bride, the church. And as we understand this, we begin to realize as stewards of the mysteries of God, we have a responsibility to advance the kingdom of God. And I say this often from the neighborhoods, our home base to the nations. And what we have to understand is, is that whenever God calls anyone, they're really just an ordinary person who is able to do something extraordinary. Uh, it is simply the natural man being hit by the super of God that makes them supernatural. Uh, so I want us to understand that God strategically called Nehemiah, who was not a prophet, as I've said, was not a priest, was not a king, he was just an ordinary guy who had a passion in his heart to do something for God. And, and see, what I want us to understand and what we have to realize, uh, and, and, and notice this now, I've been reading a book uh, this week and just about finished it, a book called Zealots. Zealots by Dave Gibbons. Zealots, uh, defying the gravity of normality. And while I was reading it, uh, he writes a compelling chapter, a uh, man entitled Success. He writes a chapter called Success. And I spent uh, a couple of hours the other day reading it, and it blew my mind away. And he talks about uh, how the reality is that it only takes a few people to provoke significant change. And the ones who cause the greatest change are often living on the fringe of society. And see, what we have to understand is, and he began to demystify this because uh, we live in a culture of excess. We live in a culture of greed. We live in a culture that magnifies everything. Uh, you know, we, we had a super size me syndrome for many years until the movies came out and we stopped doing it and all of that because we love to see things in excess. Yes, in excess, you know, uh, you have one car, somebody might say, go back and go buy three more. And we, we love to see things in excess. But you have to understand that bigger is not always better. And see, what I want us to realize, and he said this, he says, success in God's economy frequently begins with the unspectacular. It may be hidden in modest numbers. But that is exactly how God unveils his love, grace, and power. And what he said that blew me away, he said, give me a team of people who know how, and I'm building, to watch, wait, listen, people who fast, pray, and surrender, rather than always trying to take control. These are the ones developing sensitivity to the Spirit of God. If there's anything you can get from these last couple of weeks, from today, from whenever, is to be sensitive to the spirit of God. You have to know the ebb and flow of the spirit of God. To know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and the time. And that requires us to be strategic, to be strategic, to be strategic. So we must understand that success. In God's kingdom, hear me now, is about living more of a responsive life than a life of self-driven initiative. Success in God's kingdom is about living more of a responsive life than a life of self-driven initiative. And so you have to understand that just because you know your occupation does not mean you'll have success. 
And see, we normally attribute success, and we thought that uh, by living in a westernized form of culture, that success is by what you do or what you want to do. But as you really begin to study the evil perspective, especially in context of the scripture, I found and I just began to understand that success is not knowing your occupation. Success is knowing your vocation. Because of success is knowing your occupation, you will only define yourself by what people call you. And when they have nothing to call, you have nothing to feel. Because it's wrapped in your occupation. But if it is wrapped, but if it's wrapped in your vocation, then it is your calling. And your calling is to live as a servant and follow those who serve. Nehemiah, watch this now, take note of this. Nehemiah, number one, Nehemiah was an uncommon achiever. An uncommon achiever. Nehemiah was an uncommon achiever. And I submit to you today, the reason why we gather early in the morning, not only because God called us, but because literally when we get, when you gather early, it allows you to hear God clearer. That's what the psalmist said. Early in the morning will I seek thy face. And that's the difference between a prosperous person and a sluggard. If you study any prosperous people, they'll tell you they get up early before the crack of dawn. Remember this little boy getting up early to pray about the time I was about just his age or so, and I'd get ready to get up to pray, and I'd go run down the stairs, and as soon as I run down the stairs, my grandpa would come out, you up? Yeah, I'm praying. Me too. I grew up always watching my grandpa. Get up early. Early in the morning, 5 30, 6, 5 30, sometimes 4 in the morning. Get up early to pray. He rang the doorbell, took off. You up praying? Yes, sir. Come. What did God tell you? I was reared getting up early to hear God. Because I understood that there was something special he had for me to be released in the morning. So Nehemiah was an uncommon achiever. And for those purposes, follow me. Nehemiah was an uncommon achiever. Therefore, in a doubting world, uncommon achievers believe. In a slow world, they run. In a weeping world, they laugh. In a quitting world, they persevere. Say it again. He was an uncommon achiever. In a doubting world, he believed. In a slow world, he ran. In a weeping world, he laughed. And in a quitting world, he persevered. And you have to be able that when people quit, when people are afraid, when people don't do stuff, when folks are not around you, you have to be so convinced uh, in your calling that you know, 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 that God has called you for what he's called you to do. Hallelujah. He was not a perfect man. No. But... He was a productive man. God is not looking for perfection from you. He's looking for you to be productive. Because out of the productivity of your life, it allows you to creatively pursue the passion and calling that he's designed for you. Somebody say uncommon achiever. As I've shared with you in the past, uh, it takes four things. Prayer. A uh, plan. And then God sends people and people help develop process. Prayer, plan, people, process. And I want to spend some more time building on these gates. I'm building now. I want you to work with me. Uh, uh, number one, I have two questions that I want you to ask yourself this week. Number one, and write this down. Number one, who are the top ten people you need to help you complete the assignment God has given you. Who are the top 10 people you need, me being the top one, <laughs> to help you complete the assignment that God has given you? Who are the top 10 people you need to help you complete the assignment God has given you? Why? Because, Carissa, if I, if I don't understand who the people are that God has called me to help me or to help me build and to help me develop or to help me do what he's called me to do, I will always be lost. Because I'll see those who are enemies as friends and those who are friends as enemies. So you have to be able to really distinguish clearly a, a line of delineation to know who is who. Who is who? And the second question. What 
just like Nehemiah, has God been saying in your life, in your business, in your job, what God has called you to do? What is he saying that needs to be rebuilt? What is he saying that needs to be rebuilt? Re means again, 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 again. I gotta do this, I gotta write this, I gotta build this, I gotta do this. What is he saying again, 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 again? Going back to the drawing board. I remember years ago, uh, what was the song? Trevor probably know it. <laughs> I'm yours, Lord. Hide me now and see, see if I can be completely yours. You know, we used to just dance on it and all that. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I love, I love dancing, you know it. But, but the key thing is, is to see what does God need from me right now? Because where I am right now, I have not been it before. And I need God to give me wisdom, revelation, and insight for where I am right now. You following me? Now, let's work on these gates, okay? Let's go to work. Let's work on these gates. Number one, we see in verse number 13, the valley gate. The valley gate. The valley gate. Now, now I want you to understand something. The valley gate is an experience of passing through a narrow passage with steep, rocky sides like mountains. But you must understand that a valley is just a valley. It is a period of transition. Now, not all valleys, and I was, I was preparing this uh, some time ago, not all valleys are bad. In fact, Jesus called the what? The lily in the valley. The bright in the morning star. The key thing is to understand that not every valley is terrible. If you look over your life and you see all the valleys that you've experienced, all the valleys that have happened, if you really look at it now, it doesn't seem that bad. Oh, it felt horrible while you were in the valley. But it doesn't seem that bad now. Why? Because you understand that valleys are a perpetual process. That God uses valleys to mature his people. And not every experience is a near-death encounter. It may feel like it, but it's not a near-death encounter. And so we have to be able to embrace the valley. To embrace the peace. Like one of the major things that, that Dr. Sam Chan has said for years is that one of the major things that distinguishes uh, uh, mega leaders or mega gifts or mega people, whatever you want to call them, and I won't like to say mega and minor, but one of the major things that, that, that differentiates a person of larger capacity than one of smaller capacity is the amount of pain they can handle. He said, the more pain you can handle, the more your life will be. He said, the more larger you'll get, the more greater you He said, because you have to be able to endure pain. The valley gate, and I want you to hear me, the valley gate is part of our development. Well, when you hear valley, Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the shadow of the what? Valley. Key thing here is this, and here's the principle that God released to me last night. It is not the valley, it is a shadow. What is a shadow? A mirage. Which means that you have to reshape your reality. Say it again. It's not the valley itself, it's the shadow of the valley of death. Now here's the key thing, I want you to understand this. You have to reshape your reality to see where you are versus where God is calling you to. Because if you really, you know, I really think <laughs> that if God had called John and if God had told Peter, uh, you know, you know, after he had after he had told him, you know, the Bible talks about how he was in Phil, uh, Phil, what was it, Caesarea Philippi, and they're walking, and while they're walking down, they see all these big columns of Caesars because Caesar thought he was gone. And while they're walking across, seeing these big columns of Caesars in Matthew 16, uh, the Bible tells us, of course, you know, Jesus asks the question, "Who do man say that I am?" And they begin to tell him, "Some say this, some say that." Uh, why? Because he understood his environment, so he uses his environment for ministry. Now, here's the key thing: the revelation is this. Uh, Peter stands up boldly and says, "You." You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then, of course, it says, flesh and blood have not revealed that to you and all of that. But here's the key thing. Do you think that if Jesus told Peter, flesh and blood have not revealed that to you, uh, you're going to go and be persecuted? You're going to go and be crucified upside down? You're going to go and this is going to happen to you and that's going to happen to you? People are going to slap on you and they're going to lie on you they're going to hate on you? You think he would have went? No. God only shows us 30 yards at a time. 30 yards at a time. 
30 yards at a time. Why? Because it gives us enough glimpse to see and enough to hold on. 30 yards at a time. They're not going to show you, oh, they're going to shoot you, they're going to lie on you, they're going to kill you, they're going to do that, they're going to write on you, they're going to write books about you, they're going to throw your books on the floor and step on them all. He ain't going to show you all that. All he's going to do is say, trust me. And if you trust me, oh, God, have mercy. The valley gate. The valley gate is a part of our development. Without the valley, you cannot appreciate the mountain. The valley, hear me now, the valley is not designed to do you in. It is designed to bring you into a lively hope. A place where we really know the Lord is with us. Even during the toughest times. Let's stop blaming folks, some of people sin in their face because they're in a valley experience. Let people enjoy the valley. Remember one time I was doing something at a church and this lady was complaining. I think it was about her husband or something. She was going off, going off, going off, going off, going off. And it really wasn't a big issue, but she was going off, just complaining because she just liked to talk. So she was yelling, yelling, carrying on. And then the bishop leaned over, wise man, he said, Oh, be of good cheer. It's only a season. She looked back, did you hear what I just said? He said, it's only a season. He said, and seasons do change. You have to be able to understand that where you are is only a season. Oh, Pastor, it's so hot. It's only a season. And the way the season's changing today is hot right now. Tomorrow could be cold. <laughs> it's only a season. That's a whole other reason. I'm not going to go into that today. Okay. The valley gate, and let's, let's shift. The valley gate must be restored and rebuilt for a corporate anointing. They are ordained by God for a specific place, a specific time, and a specific people for a strategic usage. The valley gate helps to steer our thinking toward total trust in the Lord. James 1 and 2 says, count it all joy when you go through different temptations, tests and trials, knowing that the trying of your faith is working patience and endurance in who? You. Let's move. The dung gate, verse number 14. The dung gate, the dung gate. Need I say more? The dung gate. Uh, every ministry, every gift is to have a dung gate. New King James Version says a refuse gate. A place built in to excuse the waste and the filth that builds up in a system. Wow. This is a season for us to understand that we have to utilize the dung gate in our lives. You need a detox. You have to detox yourself from negativity, from religious spirits, from archaic mindsets, from traditions of men, from outdated theologies, and deliverance from negative thought processes. You need a detox. You have to go through the dung gate. The local church parallels itself to the human body. Are you following me? Each body needs food, fuel to live. Each human body goes through a cycle of eating, from number one, appropriation, to assimilation. And then the third thing is elimination. Appropriation, assimilation, and elimination. Each body must define its dietary modification and intake. Each body needs a gate to get rid of the matter. And this is what God was saying to me. And you have to understand, the dung of the body is not to be a kept for a rainy day or a sunny one. It is used to create a healthier you. That's why you fast and pray. To get rid of the toxins in your spirit. To be open to hear God. Because it is when you sacrifice yourself that he's able to give you something. Oh, help me somebody. That's why you got to understand. Waste management is not a sign that something is wrong. 
It is a sign that something is right. And you got to understand that when the glory of the saints are eating from greener pastures, the soul is restored through the process of elimination. I'm almost finished. And I want you to hear something that God said to me, and, and it blew me away the other day. God said to me, he said, son, you can tell what kind of stuff is in the soul of man by the things that exit his mouth. You can tell what kind of stuff is in the soul of man of a man by the things that exits his mouth. Whatever you feed, whatever feeds you, whatever you listen to, you are what you eat. And the reality is that we are living in a generation and a time that is full of demonic toxins. And you got to understand, I'm not just talking about culture, I'm talking about church people, I'm talking about folk that you know that are full of demonic toxins. Their mindsets are so negative, they'll never receive the blessing of God. And you have to get out of that stuff. Because if you don't get a detox, you'll die. Right, right. They say the average person who dies, uh, African American normally, has about 20 to 30 pounds of waste in them when they die. That was never excreted out. Sometimes you don't need a preacher to lay hands on you. Sometimes you just need God to detox you. Because what good is being laid hands on and going back home, not detox, not cleaned up? Get your spirit cleaned out. Right. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Uh, now, I want us to understand, finally, the fountain gate, the fountain gate, the fountain gate, the fountain gate. Verse number 15, the fountain gate. The fountain gate was rebuilt, and notice it was covered. And then hung and then repaired. Now you got to understand that it was built and then covered. Uh, so you have to understand that this gate defines to us, uh, uh, it looks like, in the Hebrew, it looks like an eye. It looks like an eye. Oh man, many years ago, uh, I may teach it again. Many years ago, God had given me a message. Years ago, I got to find it. Years ago, I preached a message called The Anointing of Brilliance. The Anointing of Brilliance. The Anointing of Brilliance. And the funny part is the people I preached it to. Brilliant, but <laughs> talking about the anointing of brilliance, and, and, and no pun intended. But but I want us to understand the fountain gate. <laughs> Notice now, Hagar was by the fountain in Genesis, uh, a place of refreshing in the wilderness. Now, I won't really just talk this to you. Uh, the fountain gate is a source of water, a reservoir, or a stream of water. Now here's what I want you to understand. The fountain gate is where life springs forth. It teaches us to recognize the things which produces a flowing fountain in our midst. Now here is what God said to me and I'm closing. We must discern what the fountain of life is, hear me, in the midst of us. Because if there are not things in your life flowing, get rid of it. Yes. The fountain gate teaches us that we must live in overflow. God does not just want you to have enough. He wants you to have more than enough. My cup does what? Run it over. The fountain gate, the fountain gate, the fountain gate. And see, what you must understand uh, is that as a ministry and as a church, we have to be able to understand that we must challenge anything that is not becoming a fountain in the midst of us. Put a checkup on dry brooks, dry friendship, dry relationship. You can't explain it, you can't help it, it's just dry. I had to look at my phone up there and just say, all right, we got to see, we got to do some cleaning here. Because it's just dry, you can't help that. But you cannot be growing here and then pulling people behind you like you're pulling a horse and carriage. It does not work like that. God wants to irrigate your life with water. What is water? Water represents the word. He has to irrigate your service, irrigate your life. You can't help it. You're just changing. Don't apologize for changing. Oh, I just felt that. Hallelujah. If friendships are not a fountain, address it. If connections are not a fountain, address it. You can be flowing like the riverbanks and be connected to those buried in drought. If it does not move you, if it's stagnant and stifling, let it go. 
the most dangerous words, you know, people like to talk about that was raised on the seven last words, you know, seven last words. The seven last words of any church is we've never done it this way before. And you got to understand something. That any time you have never done something any way before, it's not always the devil. It's God. Study history. If you study the 2,000 years of the church, I can tell you right now, from the last five to six, seven, I have it in my Bible. I, I, I memorize this stuff. The last seven points in church history, you'll be able to find it every time there was a major move, 506, 570 years ago with Luther. You'll find it every time there was a major move. His major opposition was the church. Gutenberg had no issue printing out Bibles. He needed money to print the Bible. He didn't have a problem printing out Bibles. Luther starts printing out Bibles and folks can't read. And what's the church do? They develop a counter-reformation to counter or constrain what he did. Because if you cannot be stopped or controlled, I will try to manipulate your gift to stop you from flowing or living in overflow. But today I tell you, it stops. Your lives uh, will overflow. Uh, let the fountain spring forth in ministry. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Perhaps the flow beneath the flood. Lose all its guilty stains. You have to be able to allow your life to overflow. The rivers are flowing. Uh, glory to God. The rivers are flowing.